Uh, hello and welcome to the second installment in the SSRC Eurasia Program webinar series on issues and quantitative methods in Eurasian studies. Uh, my name is Denise Mishowitz and I am the program coordinator here at the SSRC Eurasia Program. Let me make that big. And uh, the discussion today will be led by uh, Dr. Jane Zaviska. Uh, Jane is um, a Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Arizona. And in addition to a PhD in sociology, she has an MA in postdoctoral training in statistics. She has designed two original surveys in Russia, as well as worked with secondary surveys such as the RLMS and GGS. And as some of you know, this is the second of our webinars. Uh, in the series, and we also have an additional third webinar available on our website. Um, you can hear the last webinar from December, which was on understanding and adjusting for complex sample designs in the Eurasian context. And we have an additional webinar, which is by the numbers, quantitative data sources in Eurasian studies. And the, um, the URL of the web page where you can find recordings of these webinars is written here on the screen. And you can also just go to our program page and you'll be able to find the link to those there also. Uh, so the, today the webinar is collecting and interpreting retrospective survey data. And I am going to turn it over to Jane. Thanks very much, Denise. Um, let me start by just saying a little bit about my interest and experience in this topic. Um, I really got interested in retrospective uh, data collection while I was working on my dissertation, which was on um, changes in consumer culture and consumer inequalities from the Soviet to the post-Soviet period. And there weren't very good data available, quantitative data, for the Soviet period. And the only way really to gather it was to try to do it retrospectively, to rely on the memories um, of, of people 10 years later when I was doing research, um, which clearly has a lot of potential uh, pitfalls associated with it. Um, since then, I've been, uh, right now I'm designing um, a survey of housing experiences um, in Russia from 1992 to the present. Um, and I'll talk about both of those, those surveys that I designed. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, uh, you... Hold on. Yeah. I am I'm, I'm wondering if everything is okay continue I'm sorry okay is Jane right. uh, to the audience is Jane's screen visible you can write in the chat if it's not visible okay it seems to be fine no one is saying anything it says here stopped no one sees your screen show my screen but that's odd show my screen sorry everyone oh here we go excellent okay all right, sorry, I don't know how I did that. I'm very sorry. Okay, <laughs> starting over. Um, so I'm going to first start by talking a little bit about just the kinds of retrospective data that um, are used in the social sciences, not necessarily the Eurasian context specifically. Um, and then I'm going to just talk a very brief amount about um, theories about memory and what we know about memory and how that can help us to think about what kinds of questions we can and cannot reasonably ask people to remember and, re and report on. Um, then I'm going to talk about the post-Soviet context with some examples. And then I'm going to say a little bit about um, a, a relatively new technique that I'm working with right now called Life History Calendar, which is a visual approach. Um, for, and that could also be useful even for people who aren't doing necessarily mass surveys. It can be useful for doing qualitative interviews, too, if you want to get um, life history data. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to speak very briefly about um, analytical techniques. Obviously, in this amount of time, I can say very little. Mainly, I'll just be pointing you to some resources where you can find out more. Okay, first before I talk about retrospective data, let me say it's, it's a form of longitudinal data. Um, and that means um, longitudinal data of the kind that we're talking about is sometimes called panel data. That means repeated measures of the same respondents. I'm going to be using the example of individuals or households for my um, example of a unit analysis, but theoretically you could also collect panel data about organizations or any other unit of analysis. Um, it's, this is not the same as repeated cross-sections, so there are a lot of surveys, um, for example, the General Social Survey in the United States is, uh, you know, it's fielded every one to two years, but every time it's a, it's a new sample. So although you can look at aggregate trends over time, you can't connect at the individual level respondents um, over time because they're, they're, different, they're different people. Um, and the advantage of panel data, it's, it's much better for um, estimating causal effects. I mean, you know, experiments are the gold standard for, for studying causation, but usually um, we can't, uh, often we can't do experiments um, for the kinds of questions we're interested in the social sciences for logistical and ethical reasons. Um, and so we use observational data, that is, we just observe people as they are as opposed to trying to somehow manipulate them and experiment on them. 
Um, and panel data helps to establish causation um, first because you can verify time ordering. So there's the, you know, the classic phrase, you know, correlation is not causation. And one of the reasons you might um, go wrong in making a causal claim, um, conclusion from correlational data is you might um, be misunderstanding whether X is causing Y or Y is causing X. Well, if we have panel data, at least we can figure out which came first. Um, uh, also, individuals can serve as their own controls. And some of you may have heard of fixed effects models. That means we basically control for the things that, um, there are lots of ways in which people are different, but some of those differences, um, in, in the, and that we can't observe, but some of them we might just um, not care about, and if we, we can control for them, because like, for example, a person's IQ doesn't change over time. So if we have panel data and we see changes, um, we can you know, rule out that IQ was the cause of those changes because IQ doesn't change. Um, Okay, so uh, for those of you who are um, interested in a sort of more um, kind of formal introduction to the advantages of longitudinal data for causal modeling, I can recommend this recent annual review of sociology article that's in the note here. Um, by the way, this slides will be available online, Denise, I guess in the next week or so, um, so that you can get back to these references if you need to. Yes, that's right. We'll be posting this also on our website probably next week. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's, there's two, there are two ways we can go about collecting panel data. One is what's called the perspective approach. That means um, we actually go, we revisit the same individuals forward in time. So we start with the baseline and then we, and then we move forward in time. Um, and so, for example, I could come and survey somebody on what their income is today, and then I go visit them every month and see what their income is, and I can, and I can do a trend uh, over time. And that's, that's very advantageous from the perspective of accuracy and validity of the measures because you're not relying on memory or at least not to the same extent. Maybe you're just asking them to remember from the past 30 days instead of, you know, for the last, you know, 20 years or something like that. Um, but there are, there are some significant disadvantages. One is um, attrition bias. This is when people drop out. If they drop out systematically, that is the people who drop out are different somehow from those who don't, which is almost always true, um, uh, we have a problem. For example, if we're interested in studying Housing mobility, which is my main area of interest, uh, if people who move are more likely to drop out, which we know is true, that, that can create a problem um, because we're underestimating then the, the degree of mobility for losing the movers. Um, it's also very expensive, I mean extremely expensive. You have to have massive, massive grants to do this kind of survey research. Um, and finally, it's time consuming. If I only get my baseline data today, I can't do any time trend analysis until enough time has passed for me to have you know, a trend to talk about. So um, an example of a survey that, that does this is the Russian Longitudinal Monitoring Survey. It's conducted annually. Um, so it started, well, the, the, the most recent ver variant of it started in 1994. And um, so we do have data from 1994. If you were the one collecting the data in 94, you had to wait you know, until, until now to get your 20 years of data. Um, but we do have it. Um, and these repeated measures are, can let us do a lot of interesting things um, with analyzing trends in income, health, life satisfaction, um, all kinds of things. However, the time measure is crude because it's not even really retrospective between waves. They don't ask people, tell me about everything that happened between now and the last time we, we surveyed you. It's just, tell me about right now or the, or the last 30 days or something like that. So, um, and it also has some very serious attrition issues. So I'm going to be focusing today instead on the retrospective approach, which I think is just, it's more accessible and affordable. I mean, of course, generally survey research is expensive, but, um, you know, with a reasonable grant that, of the kind that, you know, your average assistant professor can get and even some graduate students, you can, you can do this kind of research. Um, so this, you ask the respondent to report on their own past. And um, there's no attrition bias then because there's, you know, you're only, you only have to, find the person once, so they can't really drop out as long as they've already agreed to participate. Um, uh, it's much cheaper, and, and again, you don't have to wait for that data to come in um, for time to pass. But there are also major disadvantages, error um, in recall, and um, uh, that's the main thing I'm going to be talking about. Also, they can be very long, take a long time to co complete these kinds of surveys. In fact, this is something that we're, I'm dealing with right now in pilot testing of my housing survey. Is, it's just taking way too long. We're having to make some, some tough decisions on what to cut. Um, okay, so uh, an example of a, of a high quality survey, this was collected by Ted Gerber, is called the, um, the Survey of Stratification and Migration Dynamics in Russia. Um, and he administered the survey in 2001. Actually, this should say 1985, that's a typo, retrospective to 1985. So they asked people to provide 
complete histories from 1985 of all the times they moved, all the jobs they had, and other kinds of activities they did if they weren't working. Their, not just their educational attainment, but their enrollment, the years that they were in school and what kinds of places, um, and all kinds of other things. And um, some really interesting papers have emerged from this. You can just look at his website to find them. Um, I'm just going to show you an example of how they go about collecting the histories for employment. These are um, labor, or uh, they're called activity reports, um, activity histories. So this is a common script. We like to know how your primary occupation was changing since 1985 to the present. Um, tell us um, uh, what, you know, in the order of what should happen, what changes happened, including your, all your jobs and all your breaks from work. Okay. Um, and then they get shown a card, and so this gives them an idea of what is the range of kinds of um, changes in your status, your, your occupational status that um, are of interest to the, to the survey researchers. And I'm, I'm not going to leave time to read through all of these, but it just gives you a, a, an idea of the kinds of things they're interested in. Um, this gets then recorded, the interviewer, this, the, the respondent doesn't see this, the respondent only sees the card. The interviewer then, um, you know, fills in the kind of event and then the beginning and ending month and year. I'm sorry, the, the month and year of the change, because then the, I guess the beginning of one, the end of one is the beginning of the next. Um, and then, um, for particular kinds of events, depending on the code, they might want to ask follow-up questions. So, for um, jobs as opposed to, say, leaves of some kind or, you know, dropping out of labor force for just for a few, if they were actually employed, then they get asked, and that's all these codes or the, or the employment codes, um, follow-up questions, which now, now we're moving back to what I'll call a standard survey um, um, uh, format where um, you kind of go through asking a, a series of questions about the first job. I'm not, I didn't show more than one question, but there's like about, you know, 20 questions here on the kind of job they had. This is like what, what kind of organization do they work for? But there's a lot more questions. And then after they get through the first one, then they start over with the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and so on. Um, let me just mention that a lot of prospective surveys, those that do, you know, repeat, measure, repeat visits to the same um, uh, people or households, um, also include a retrospective component. Actually, in some ways, this is the ideal. Um, uh, and the reason is that even if we are, when we're, as I mentioned with the RLMS, we're not observing people continuously. Often we can only visit them once a year or once every two years. So um, you miss a lot of potential interesting dynamics between, you know, the waves of the survey if you don't ask them about what happened in the interim. And so um, uh, the highest quality of these kinds of surveys, like the Gender, uh, gender and Generation Survey does this, um, ask them whether there have been any, any changes at all, at over, even if, you know, it's then reverted back to whatever the baseline was since the previous visit. Um, also, many prospective surveys contain a retrospective component in the first year of the survey just to establish um, uh, baseline data for the past. Um, so, in the gender and generation survey, they first, you know, let's say they get, I'll show you the, what the questions look like in a minute, but they'll get a history of all of their marriages and, and partnerships, so, you know, and domestic partners and marriages. Um, you know, let's say the first wave was collected in 2001. Um, so we have all of their history to 2001, then they get visited, th you know, three years later. Let's say it's 2004. I think I might, maybe it was 2004, 2007. I can't recall now. But um, then they'll ask them, you know, are you still with the person you were with in 2004? And if not, you know, a series of questions that I'll show you. The nice thing about this actually also is that it, it, it means they're probably going to get more accurate data. It's easier for people to remember these kinds of events over a couple of years than over their whole lifetimes. So this is the example from the first, this is the first um, round of the, um, the Gender and Generation Survey. So this is getting, you know, have you ever lived with anybody or been married to anybody? And again, this is, this is that format um, of, you know, let's ask all these questions about the first one, and then if there were any other partnerships, if that one ended, then we go to second, third, fourth, et cetera. Then, in, then the next time they come back, a few years later, they ask them, were you living with the same, with a person um, when, we, when we visited you last time, and are, were you married to them, um, have there been changes in their marital status um, since then, and are, are they still living with them? And then if not, they get asked about kind of what happened, how did it end, um, and then if after that, um, you know, there were, there were any new partners. Uh, so um, that's just to give you a general flavor of what, the, what I mean when I'm talking about retrospective data and what the surveys look like. Um, do we have any questions before I move to the next section? 
Denise? Okay, um, I was muted. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can type them into oh. the question panel that you'll see on your control panel, and you can type those in at any time. For example, if you have any questions on what's already been covered, then you can type those in now. Um, and at the end uh, of the presentation, we'll also uh, go over any of the questions that come up between, between now and then. So we just had one question submitted, Jane. Mm -hmm. And uh, will you talk about how these surveys are piloted? Yes, I will, actually. I am going to talk about that. OK, that will be coming. Yeah. OK, mm -hmm. here's another one. Uh, can this research be applied to ancient societies? Huh, well. Yes and no. I mean, you could, I mean, no, not really, not this particular form, because, I mean, you can definitely do retrospective record collection. Like if there are some kind of administrative records or something like that, I mean, historians do that. And if you have, I mean, if you have data, quantitative data, where you have repeated measures over time, you can use the statistical methods that I'll talk about at the end. But you can't actually collect retrospective data about ancient mm -hmm. times now because the people that you would need to speak to aren't alive anymore. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and another question. I was wondering if you are aware of any longitudinal data sets on Central Asia. You can just um, name the, the large ones. <laughs> hmm, I think there are some demographic and health surveys. I believe so, too. That, that, that would have retrospective data in them. And I'll, I'll tell this, um, this uh, question asker, Gulnara, that on our website for the webinar by, by the numbers, uh, Eurasian Data Sources, if you go to that web page, you can download a document that has a list that we collected of different data sources on Eurasia. So you can just consult that document. It's very easy to find. It, it still to be, remains to be seen whether this will happen, but um, Ted Gerber and I actually have a grant proposal under review right now to, to actually do just that. Um, and and uh, Kyrgyzstan is the only country that we would have in Central Asia. Well, and, and Azerbaijan, depending on how you define uh, Central Asia, would also be part of that. But, but we don't know whether we're going to do it yet. But if we do, the data will be available in about three years. <laughs> <laughs> Sit tight. Uh, OK, yes. uh, that, that's the questions for now. But to the participants, okay. you can continue to send those in as we're progressing, or you can hold them to the end, whichever you prefer. Mm -hmm. OK. Okay, all right, so now let me talk more generally about, about memory. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, okay. so um, I mean, this is, this is like what I can tell you about memory in five minutes, not much. But basically, um, we know from cognitive psychology um, uh, that memory is organized in, in hierarchies. That is, certain kinds of memories are nested inside other ones. So the most salient, you know, significant events kind of come first, and then others get nested inside those thematically. So people organize their memories in terms of domains of their lives. So they might associate housing, marriage, family, you know, um, wealth, and things like that all in, in one domain. And then there's the stuff that goes on at work as another domain. And those are those those memories are kind of often separated from each other, actually how they're stored in the brain. And then of course temporally. And that can either go forward to backward, you know, remembering from now that back in time, or backward to forward in time. Um, if you if you want to know about, um, and I'm talking here about autobiographical memory specifically, but the same could be said. Uh, analogous things could probably be said about memories of, for example, managers that work for organizations. Ultimately, it's still autobiographical because it's their individual memory. We're not talking about collective memory here in the in the um, sort of theoretical sense. Um, so, uh, and let me just say here, um, Robert Belly, um, and I'll mention him again, is, I think, that has the, done the best research on event history calendar approaches to measuring memory. Um, we'll come back to that later. So memory is very fallible for measuring um, subjective states in the past. It's not a very good idea to ask people now, what was your opinion about X 10 years ago, or even a year ago? Because generally speaking, those responses say a lot more about the respondent now. Then they, they actually tell you about the past. People just, they, they, the memory, you know, people avoid cognitive dissonance. So they tend to perceive their, their, their attitude states and their opinions as being more consistent than actually they often are. Um, uh, there's also, you know, nostalgia effects, things like that. Um, we can measure, we can ask them, you know, why did they vote, or did they vote, but, and even that there are some issues with, but at least it's a genuinely, you know, it's a sort of behavior that we're measuring. But asking them why they voted for someone in the past is, is also probably not a very good idea, um, in a survey especially, you know. Um, and then emotions as well. Um, you know, that's not, a, you know, you'll find this kind of stuff in, in various surveys, um, but the experimental literature um, on this, this 
this does not provide support for, for, for these kinds of measures. Um, um, it's also, um, the further back you get in time, the more fallible memory is, especially, the, and the less salient or significant the event is. So people will almost always remember the, the, the year their child was born, their first child was born. You know, that's one of those kind of life-changing events that people tend to remember. Um, but they might not remember, especially, it depends on their probably socioeconomic status, but they might, but they might not remember actually w very accurately their income from 10 years ago. Um, how much taxes they paid, what classes they took, you know, the first year, first year of college, I couldn't tell you that actually now. Um, how many hours of TV they watched, you know, they, they just people just don't usually remember that kind of stuff for very long. So it's better to ask these kinds of retrospective questions about things we could call facts or behaviors. Um, moves, births, job changes, you know, whether they voted or not, um, uh, who they voted for, um, even that, if you go back more than a few years, also tends to sort of degrade with memory. Um, you're also going to get more, you know, other things being equal, more accurate memories for more recent time periods, significant life events, and significant life course stages. So people will often remember pretty vividly the year that they left their parents' home, you know, and the kinds of um, sort of, you know, setting up with their first household, that kind of thing. They also often, you know, if you go talk to retired people, the year they retired is a very memorable year for most of them. Um, there are, there's variation in um, some of the, anyone with demo, demographic background will know what this means, but I'll explain it for everyone else, age, period, cohort um, combinations. So um, age, so respondents who are different ages, that is, you know, different number of years since they were born, vary in the quality of their memories at various life stages. So somebody who's 24 is going to remember their college years obviously better than somebody who's 40. Um, but also major events in the time, in periods, so by period we're talking about a calendar year anchor memory. So clearly for the, you know, for post-Soviet people, you know, depending on which country they were in, 1989 to 1991 is a very significant period. If they were, had, if they were old enough to remember anything then, that's going to be a, um, one of those sort of hinge moments in their personal histories that corresponds to a, a major change in, in kind of, you know, their nation's history um, that organized memory. Now, um, cohort, age, and period are all sort of, I mean, if you, you can take two, two of these and always figure out what the third one is. So if we know what, what year it is and we know how old somebody is, then we can figure out what their cohort is. That's the generation, right? So every, people that were born in the 60s have a different experience of, their, of, of what it was like to be 25 than people who were born, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, so we have to kind of take all these things into consideration. The, the point here is that it's going to vary based on the research question you have, the demographic of interest and and the and the historical context that you're working in, which of these kinds of factors, um, how they're going to combine to make some things more memorable than others. Um, so there's one there is a good reason why. I mean, the main place in, in social science that you see this kind of research is with so-called demographic life course research because that's just the easiest and cheapest stuff, you know, really to remember or to, to measure in a, in a mass survey. There's tons of these retrospective demographic surveys. That's why I said to the question about the Eurasian context, if there's nothing else, I'm sure there's a demographic health survey because they're done almost everywhere. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think that this kind of data and these techniques are under, I'm not really a demographer, but, uh, and I'm trying to use these kind of techniques now, and I'm sort of self-taught with this kind of thing, um, but I'd like to see uh, more people doing this kind of thing, and um, uh, I'll talk, you know, moving is also a sort of a demographic variable, but it's, it's more than that. Um, but these are the other kinds of things that you can, you can socioeconomic kind of variables that you can get um, with retrospective measures. What can we do to make um, recall better? Um, there's, if you're ever going to read one thing about this, I would recommend um, chapters two and three of this book, Asking Questions. I, I teach um, uh, my research design class with this book, and um, it's very accessible, great examples. Um, and these chapters focus on asking about non-sensitive and sensitive questions about behavior. And actually, how we go about helping to improve, not just recall, but reporting. Okay, so there's, the, there's can people remember, and then will, will they tell you the truth? Those are sort of two different issues. And that's going to vary based on whether or not they, it's a sort of an embarrassing um, uh, topic or not. Um, I don't have time to get into that now, um, unless maybe in the question and answer, but this is the place to go for that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, other things being equal, the more specific of the question you ask, the, the, the easier it is going to be for the person both to remember and to understand what it is that you want them to recall. So if I ask somebody, you know, over the past five years, you know, about how much TV did you watch? I mean, that's a pretty vague question, especially these days with TV. Well, what are you going to count Netflix online with that or not? 
you know, maybe you want to ask about something like the new term for you know, childbearing is screen time. You know, how much time did you spend for entertainment purposes in front of a screen? Um, and you might want to make it the last week or the last 30 days, not, you know, um, and then you give them specific, you help them figure out what, um, what are the uh, units that you want them to report in, you know, how many times, how many days per week, how many hours per week, um, you know, and so on. Um, and you need to calibrate the time periods to the ceiling. So again, TV watching is such an everyday activity that people don't tend to have very vivid memories beyond the past week for something like that. Um, so you need to, um, you know, be reasonable in your demands on the, the memory abilities of the respondent um, based on the, the, the issue domain that you're asking them to remember. This is an interesting thing that I never, never would have occurred to me, but there's experimental evidence to show that it works. Just slowing down um, and also just adding filler words to the question just to make it take longer to ask it actually leads to better responses. And the reason for that is that um, survey respondents typically, um, they, they don't really know how to be a survey respondent because it's a sort of, you know, not everyday kind of um, context. And so they apply the norms from everyday language use to the survey. And one thing in everyday language use is that very, very long pauses and, and turn taking in conversation are kind of awkward for most people. And so if you ask a question and it's a short question, short and to the point, they kind of are going to assume that you want a short and to the point answer and you don't want them to take very long. So they're going to do, they're going to estimate without thinking it through very carefully. Um, whereas if you um, kind of slow it down, it just sort of makes it more socially acceptable for them to slow down too and to really think it through. You can also directly prompt them to say, please take your time um, and, you know, as much time as you need, you know, if it's something you really need to be accurate, you have to think about that as the researcher too, how important is that accuracy, um, because the longer you have them take to answer any given question, the fewer questions you can typically ask. Um, you can also leverage the hierarchical nature of memory, and this involves recall aids that I'm going to talk about in, in a few minutes. So I'm going to move, um, uh, oh yeah, so the issue of, of validation, um, this is related to piloting. Um, the best way to do this, there are some um, experiments where people have actually, they do a prospective survey where they actually have the actual measure, you know, in real time. And then, you know, when they come back five years later, they ask them to remember, you know, uh, to, to just re report retrospectively the same information. And so then you can actually compare and see if there is discrepancy or not. And there's a huge actual um, kind of experimental literature on this. If you're ever going to design this kind of survey, you should read that experimental literature because some of it might apply um, you know, beyond, the, you know, these, these tests are usually done in Western countries, but um, some of the findings could, could apply anywhere um, to see what kinds of measures are people more or less likely to have trouble remembering. Um, sometimes you can compare to official records, uh, like um, in some countries, you know, um, researchers have access to tax records, um, and you can actually combine, you can compare the tax record to people's reports on their incomes and things like that. Um, or you can ask other people that you think for some reason might actually have more knowledge than the respondent, um, like their parents, their spouses, or their employers for, for particular questions. Okay, so I'm going to take another short pause and ask for questions. Otherwise, I'm going to move to some examples. Okay, uh, we have one question so far, which is, uh, if it's a poor idea to ask about subject subjective states in the past in a survey, do you feel the same applies for an interview? Um, that's a really good question, and I and and, and I, I go back and forth on this. Um, I think that you have to use the same kind of caution um, to uh, 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 you know real. I, I think it's okay to ask it if what you're doing is trying to understand the person holistically in the in the present. Okay, but if you, I'm not I'm not convinced that even in depth interviews you can really get very good data about subjective states in the past. However. I think there are some context, when you have enough contextual information in the, in the context of a qualitative interview, um, that can help in, in, for example, if they're telling a story about some really vivid thing that happened to them, like a car accident they were in, or, you know, a divorce, um, or a marriage, um, you, you can sort of triangulate across the sort of, you know, it, it, if there's a reason to think that that memory is really imprinted. You know, then the stuff they tell you about what's going on around the margins at that same period of time is probably also more accurately imprinted. So that's one example of how you could maybe try to use, um, I, mean, I think you'd be better off doing that with, with qualitative data. I think you have no chance really with, with, with survey data of really knowing what you're getting is the problem. So, you know, qualitative method is probably better for that, but still, still fraught with problems. Okay, and 
Um, another question, excuse, sorry, one sec, is what are, oh, sorry, there was another one before that. Are traumatic experiences as salient as good experiences? Um, yes, and actually probably more. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, uh, well, okay, there's, there's two issues here, salience, and then there's, again, um, rep reporting accuracy. They are more salient, they are highly salient, but they are also very difficult for people to talk about. And so you can actually just shut an interview down by asking too much about traumatic experiences. You have to be careful. I'm going to give you an example, actually, in a minute of, of, of a survey that does that. Um, uh, but yeah, of course, anything that stands out in memory that, that sort of where you, where you see it as a, as a landmark. I mean, that's actually the term that's used in this literature as landmarks. There, there are external landmarks things that happen out there in, in the world, and then there are personal landmarks, things that happen to you. That can be either bad or good things. And there's a follow-up on that, which is, what are the ethics of asking about traumatic experiences? Um, <laughs> you know, I think that that's actually a topic for another, another webinar, maybe. Um, I, I've actually written an article about, about uh, you know, ethics and ethnographic field work, but I think the same, I think it's the same, I, are, you know, issues. I actually think it's probably even more of an issue with quantitative research because the interviewer has to be trained. Um, you know, the ethics, the little issues would involve um, is, the, is, the, is the harm, potential harm to the respondent or potential risk of harm um, outweighed by the potential good to society that the research can be expected to, to produce. I think that's one standard that can be used. Also, are there any measures to mitigate, like if somebody starts having a breakdown because you're asking them about the death of a child, do you have resources to help them after you've sort of, you know, triggered that um, or not? Um, when I did this kind of research with qualitative interviews, I always had with me actually, um, you know, some re some, you know, references to you know psychological counseling and things like that. But I also, as the as the researcher, could could put on my you know pseudo therapist hat for a few minutes. But I don't know that you can expect an interviewer in a in a mass survey to do that. Okay, okay. we can carry on. That's all for now. All right. Okay. So recall and post Soviet context. Okay, so um, why would we want to do this? I think there are two main reasons, and, and one you might not have thought about as much, or well, I should say I, I, I really just thought about this recently, although I've been doing it, is that we, we sometimes want to use these post-Soviet surveys just to understand the Soviet period, because there was limited Soviet, there was limited ability to collect survey research or, um, in the Soviet period. Now, you know, we're running to the, we're getting to the point where it's been enough years have passed that I'm not sure how much longer we'll be able to do that, if at all. I mean, the kinds of questions you can ask now about the Soviet period that you can get any decent data on are, are dwindling, right? You can probably still get, you know, these major demographic kind of um, events, but other than that, I'm not sure what else you can really get. Um, unless you have some other kind of um, data source um, that either the respondent or the researcher has access to that, that provides some kind of, um, you know, archival record. Um, so, but an example of a survey that was done, it was, this was done right after the collapse, uh, when, when these countries opened up and, and, and um, you know, foreign research teams could, could do res uh, survey research. Uh, one of the best examples is the social stratification in Eastern Europe um, uh, setting. I think it's six different countries. It's, I think it's like five Eastern European countries in Russia. I, I can't remember all of them now. Um, but it has a lot of retrospective measures of the Soviet period. Um, uh, and not only about the respondents, but about their parents, their grandparents. I mean, it's an amazing data set that's been really underutilized, actually. Um, so anyone who's interested in kind of Soviet social history in the, you know, the late Soviet period um, might want to take a look at that data source, and it's really available. Um, uh, the other reason is that you might want to analyze trends over time in the post-Soviet period, um, so, you know, you could do either of those. Um, now, what, what are some, why, what, how can we, what about the post-Soviet context is sort of different than maybe, let's say, just any other context? Uh, what are the, the specific historical issues? One is that the Soviet collapse creates a clear um, a, a time period marker, okay? That's a landmark in people's memories. Well, you have to be old enough. Um, it's probably not a landmark in memory for somebody who was born in, you know, 1987, um, but it probably is for somebody who was born in 1980, actually. Um, so, um, you know, the age of the person at the time of the collapse is going to affect the degree to which this is actually a period marker for them. And I could be, I mean, you know, I'm just speculating here, but it seems like that's probably the most salient for those whose life courses were really radically altered while they were young adults. You know, those who were, you know, let's say in their 30s, 20s and 30s, um, <coughs> or, well, actually really working, I would say working age people. People were already retired, I mean, definitely had its effect, but it wasn't the same kind of effect. Um, 
uh, as for people who had to really just reconstruct their careers and their entire life strategies, didn't you know the older people at least usually had housing, whereas the younger people didn't. So um, and you think about it in terms of cohorts as well. Um, what are some external landmarks? So I'm just going to give you some examples of two surveys, but both of them designed by me. So that happens. <laughs> um, so one is the survey of housing experiences in Russia. You can try to help people remember personal events or states by referring them to external ones. So for the the housing one, this is this is a pilot, you know, it's still being piloted, but this is our working um, prompt is, could you please tell me about the dwelling you were living in in, ni in January 1992? Allow me to remind you that January 1992 is when most prices were freed in Russia. And um, based on my qualitative research and just talking to, you know, a lot of Russians about this, well, that's a pretty stark memory for a lot of people. Is you know, one day the government's controlling the prices, the other day almost everything just, you know, starts floating. Um, in the prices. Um, so that, that, that helps people because we really want, we want everyone to start at the same baseline. And even if we say 1992, well, this is a year when there's a lot of, you know, crazy stuff happening. And so, you know, we want to make sure people are even, we want to try to get them even down to the month. Um, uh, for the consumption survey that I did for my dissertation, this is just in one, st one city called Kaluga in Russia. Um, I said, frequently I'll ask you questions about how your family lived in 1985. We understand it's not easy to remember. Therefore, let me remind you that 1985 was when Gorbachev became the general secretary of the Communist Party, but the period of perestroika and glasnost was only beginning. Then we also tell them, if you don't remember that year in particular, try to at least remember the mid-1980s. If you don't remember it at all, maybe you know something from the stories of your relatives, and if you like, you can ask for help from somebody else. And we weren't trying to get at subjective states here. We were trying to get at um, uh, sort of behaviors, and, uh, particularly household-level behaviors. So we were okay with having a proxy respondent. Um, you know, a family member would step in and, and help if the respondent was young. And we actually also had, um, we actually asked them directly how hard was it, could you remember, can you remember this period at all, how difficult was it for you to remember, um, you know, it's just kind of a validity question um, later in the survey. Um, now, what, so let's think about what are the kinds of things that people could be reasonably expected to remember. Okay, this is in 2002. Um, so we're saying, t t this is 17 years ago. So this is a question that I think that most um, Soviet Russians, and I hazard to say probably most Soviet people anywhere, could probably answer. Did your household have a car in 1985? You know, getting a car was a, was a pretty major event in most people's lives, um, and so people tended to know whether they had one or not, and they tended to remember even when, when, when it was purchased. If somebody was really young, they might not know the year, they, and they might have to ask somebody for help with that one. The model, again, probably only older people would be able to answer that. Um, not, well, when I say older, I mean people who were older than 10 you know, at the time. Um, now, did your family travel to Moscow for food products? Okay, Kaluga is only about a, well, at the time it was about a three-hour train ride. Um, and so, you know, but even then only, uh, you know, maybe about half of families went, um, you know, once a year, and some went all the time, you know. Um, this is actually the, the percent, I'm sorry, 26% only, went, this is the frequency distribution, I forgot that that's what these numbers are. So a quarter didn't go, but, you know, three quarters went um, uh, more often, or at least claim they did. And I should say that, you know, I, um, I did a lot of in-depth um, in interviews before I designed this survey and ethnographic observation. And at this point in time, I don't think it's true anymore, but at this point in time, people were still making a lot of comparisons to the Soviet period um, when they were going about their business, um, when it came, especially when it came to things like um, acquiring food. Um, this one I'm less certain about. A lot of surveys ask this question, including the RLMS. Um, people claim that, um, you know, salaries were so fixed that everybody, can, you know, who was of age to receive a salary can remember it. Um, you know, so I pretty much, I put that on there because everybody else was, but I haven't actually validated this. I don't have a good sense of whether or not this is a reliable measure or not. Um, now, when I mentioned about, you know, how should we interpret retrospective questions about attitudes or, you know, feelings or something, okay, here's a question. If we compare the holiday table in your home today um, with the holiday table, you know, basically how you celebrate the holidays in 1985, what do you, when, when did you celebrate, do you, you know, which was better, do you celebrate today, better or worse, or nothing has changed since then? That's not really a truly retrospective question. I would not use that as, a, um, uh, to, as an assessment of the actual change in like the quality of the foods or something like that. Um, uh, because again, it's, it, there's both nostalgia or cynicism in the other direction can really be at operating here. Okay, so people are dissatisfied right now. They tend to re um, remember the past is better than maybe it objectively was and vice versa. 
Okay. Um, and then also, which of the following statements are food products? Um, uh, you know, most people are kind of tending toward these, these middle categories, but there are, you know, the ones that are in the extremes probably have some pretty extreme um, um, nostalgia or cynicism um, about what it was like to try to get food in those days. So, but I didn't, I didn't ask these questions with the intention of, of using them as measures of, of life in 19, 1985. I used them as measures of how people um, interpret the, pa the present in, with, uh, in contrast to the past. So they're really measures about now or about in the moment of the interview, not about the past. Um, how can we validate recall? Um, well, I'll just give some examples from my own work. So in the consumption study, I did in-depth interviews um, for a year, I mean, you know, many of them, and also a bunch of ethnography. And that established, the, for example, the salience of travel to Moscow. People talk, I mean, all the time, when that, well, especially probably because of the context of talking to an American. I mean, it was like, it seemed like it was one of the first things they would do was tell me the joke about the, well, you know, what's long and green and smells like sausage, you know, the electric train to Moscow. Um, so, and, and then it went on from there. Um, people could tell you very vivid memories of, you know, what stores they went to, their special stores that they would only tell their friends about, and how they felt when they were treated by Muscovites and all kinds of stuff. So, again, I doubt that this is a salient now. This is now, it's, you know, 12 years ago even that I asked these questions. Um, in, the, in the housing survey, so this is talking about the pilot issue, um, actually before I even applied for a grant to, to do a, a large survey, um, I did a very extensive qualitative interview study um, qualitative interviews, archival research, and um, uh, published, published a book based on the research. Um, and um, I did also in the book, uh, there's also some analysis using the RLMS of existing survey data, but it's not, there's limits to what you can do with it. So um, I think it was my qualitative research that enabled me to convince myself and ultimately, you know, the National Science Foundation that it is still possible to get decent quality data on housing retrospectively in Russia. Um, we were concerned about what is the youngest age group that we could actually do this with. And so we're actually not going to interview anybody who's under 32 um, because they'll have been so young in 92 that it's just not reasonable to expect them to, to, to really report anything. Um, but the other thing we're going to do is, um, I'll come to that in a minute. Another thing you can do is use formal records. So um, with Ted Gerber's uh, stratification surveys, his employment surveys, one of the advantages of doing this kind of research in the uh, post-Soviet context is people had all of these um, changes in jobs and changes in, in place of, of residence were recorded in their internal passports um, and actually still are, although now I'm not sure how accurate they are because people have a lot of incentive to not actually, you know, to work informally and, and, and not to register where they live. Um, but, you know, then it was probably a a, a, be a better record, and even if it wasn't completely accurate, it still it provides those landmarks I was talking about, those anchors in time of, you know, probably if there was a, a recorded job change or a recorded move, it probably happened. Um, there may have been others that happened that weren't recorded, but those landmarks help people to fill in the blanks too. So um, in his um, survey, he encouraged the interviewers to encourage respondents to refer to their passports, their internal passports, um, to help them remember these things. Finally, we can use these knowledgeable third parties. So just interestingly, um, <laughs> this is not in, in the post-Soviet context, but in, I think in the U.S. there was research that showed that um, men report the date of marriage with about a, it's like about 8% of them report it with error, and only like half a percentage of women reported it with error. So it's still not a lot of error even for the men, but the women do tend to remember these things more, probably their anniversaries as well as we know. Um, there's also um, one thing we're going to do, we haven't done it yet with the, with the housing survey, is because it's kind of a, I mean, it's a survey, a large survey, but we're thinking, treating it as a pilot study, too, to look at the feasibility of doing this same kind of thing in other post-Soviet contexts. We're going to actually um, try to interview a sample of our respondents' parents, of the younger ones. And we're going to ask them the same set of questions about the housing in 1992 as we asked the, the respondents, and then we can compare and see whether or not we're right that the memories are reasonably good. Okay, so um, I guess I'm sort of running a little bit out of time here. How are we on time here, Denise? Um, uh, I don't know how much you have left, but it, 10 minutes. Is that okay? About I think 10 more minutes? 10 minutes, of, yeah, just at the most to leave time for questions. Yeah, okay. All right, so let me just show you quickly then about the calendar approaches. I'm not going to have much time on this, but um, um, I'm just going to skip the pre preface here and just show you that another way of recording these kind of, um, you know, histories over time, this is how we're doing housing, is 
we asked them about where they were living in 1992, and they actually draw, or the interview helps them draw on, a, on this calendar. So the number represents the month and the year. So they were living on Pioneer Street from our baseline period to they moved out in December 1997. Actually, there should be a line here. I just did this today. Sorry. <laughs> this is an error. There should be a line here to show they were away in the Army. They came back, and then they moved um, again. This, this is a of hierarchical memory. People can remember this stuff more easily than they can remember when did you have your own room. Um, by own room, in this context, we mean room by your, to yourself or share with a spouse. Um, um, when they, can, they can remember, well, I had my own room the whole time I was living with my parents. And um, they can then go back and, you know, and, and, and so that's how, why these things correspond. Um, they also remember that they had, um, the only time in their lives that there was a room that no one was sleeping in was when his sister had moved out, moved out of, her, out of the house. But then she moved back in here, and that's when they lost their dedicated living room. I'm not going to go over the rest for time reasons. We can then use, um, down here, we can then use um, the housing history also to help them anchor memories of who they were living with. So when were they living with their mother, their father? And then this also helps them remember things like the date of death of their father. If anything, they probably remember the date of the death of their father, and that's how they remember um, when they stopped living with him. But and we have other, you know, I'm not showing it, but ways of, of recording that that's what happened there. Um, um, spousal, partnership histories, um, his sister, et cetera. Um, there's much more, but I'm not going to have time to show it to you. But just briefly, then what you can do is you can say, Go back here and see which of these were apartments or houses. We're not interested in asking a lot of details about the quality of dorms or barracks because we know that they're not high quality. Um, but we can ask specifically about that, the apartments and houses they lived in. And then we have a lot of questions that are that we're going now back to the standard format here. So the point is we don't try to record everything on these calendars. We just record enough to where it provides a frame of reference, a visual frame of reference for the respondent. And there's very strong, again, experimental evidence that this leads to more accurate um, memory and more accurate reporting if the interviewers are properly trained. Um, it also helps the interviewer to check for gaps or overlaps. In fact, I could just see now that I made a mistake here uh, because there should not be any period where there's no um, line you know, for housing. And also, people should not have more than one primary residence at a time, so there should not be any overlap um, in those lines. Um, the disadvantage is that you have to train your personnel in a certain way, and also the data entry is more complex. But those are really the only disadvantages. Um, so um, I'll just show you quickly one interesting survey that's doing this with computer-assisted interviewing. I mean, we can't afford to do that. We're still doing paper and pencil, and that has its limits. But if you can use it do a computer, then it's really amazing what you can do. This is something with a survey of, of elderly people, including some Eastern European countries. And just to show you kind of what it looks like, earlier in the survey, they do the same kind of timeline thing, but then the computer kind of organizes the relevant um, time frames for each individual question. And if the per it also has a, um, a database of external events and personal events. So the person says, well, here's, by the way, about the sensitive you know, um, you know, traumas from the past. Um, uh, they can remember, you know, um, I became homeless you know, the year I got married, or I was committed to a psychiatric institution, um, you know, the year, um, whatever this year, the moving statues, I don't know what that is. Um, but then the, then the interviewer can just type in quickly, you know, what was that keyword and, and try to find the year. So you can just imagine how much more power this has when you can do this kind of thing. Um, okay, I'm just going to spend a few minutes just giving you a couple of, of, of references on how you analyze this kind of data. And mainly what I just want you to think about and, and retain is that there is not one technique for analyzing longitudinal data, and you should make sure you're using the right one before you get started. And that depends on what you want to know and how your data is structured. Um, if all you want to know about is if you're just using this retrospective to get at one point in time in the past, let's say you want to run some regressions on life in 1985, well, you can just use whatever kind of techniques you use when you have data at one, and for one point in time. However, you need to think about the errors um, that attrition from your samples might lead to. To explain what I mean, think about, I survey 70-year-olds now about um, their lives 20 years ago. Um, that's my attempt to get a data about 50-year-olds in, in 20 years ago, right? The problem is some of those 50-year-olds in 1990 are not going to show up in my survey now because they're dead, they left the country, or they're more, you know, they're systematically, um, you know, more difficult to find for whatever reason. So um, uh, this is something that can be measured and controlled for um, and should be. 
if you have demographic data, you know, to, um, that you can use to, to figure out what the discrepancies are. Um, in terms of the substantive questions, the main issue is, are you trying to describe tr or explain trends? That is, you, know, you can think about just you know, growth or de decay of various kinds of phenomena that change over time, or are you trying to predict events? And those are two very different kinds of questions with completely different kinds of um, modeling techniques. And then also another really important one is, is how have you measured time? Do you have a continuous measure of time, or is it discrete? So um, usually, the reason that demographers always want to get the month, even if they don't really care about the month of things like moves and births and things like that, is they want to be able to use continuous time statistical techniques. And uh, we typically consider that having data over you know, a number of years down to the month is enough um, fine gradation of time to treat as continuous. But often we don't have that. We might just have, say, five years, you know, annual, annual points, and there are other kinds of statistical techniques for doing that. Um, uh, finally, this is just um, some references. If you, if you, if you um, want to sort of start looking into this kind of thing and you don't know where to start and there's no class for you to teach, this is the best book to go to. Um, this is Singer and Willett. These are a couple more that are more recent. Um, and um, everyone should know about the UCLA Statistical Consulting website. They have worked the examples from all of these books and many others so that if you, you can take in multiple software packages. So if you use SPSS, you can find how do you recreate you know, a particular figure in one of these um, you know, books? For, where's, what's the code for it? You can also find it for you know, Stata and a bunch of other statistical packages. Um, there's also great online videos, tutorials. Everyone who's in this audience now obviously is, familiar, is comfortable with online education, so you can find a lot more on the method for this kind of thing. Not, not really on the collection. There's very little out there in general on, on the, collecting this kind of data. Um, there's not really one place to look for that. But, on the on the um, the analytical techniques that literature is a lot more developed and sort of user friendly. All right, I'll stop there and see if there are more questions. Okay, so everyone, please uh, write in any questions that you have on the, the the topic in general, or if you have any other questions that you think Dr. Zaviska could help you with. We had one question on data sources that came in earlier, which is: Are you aware of any? Uh, ethnography or ethnology research, especially about household structure in Central Asia or specifically Turkmenistan? I know that's not your area, but <laughs> if, you, if you have any ideas. Jane? Jane? Hello? Hi, did you hear that? Yes, I'm sorry, I muted myself and then forgot to... Oh, okay, great. Yes, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, um, I will. Okay, so um, I don't know of anything that specific. That's generally, to find that out, you really want to go probably to look at published literature, you know, on that topic and see if you can track down um, the, you know, often ethnographers, um, well, I shouldn't say ethnographers, if they do interviews, I mean, pure ethnography is probably not going to get you this kind of data because you're not really going to often get it sort of organically. Like, you kind of have to pro prompt for it. So it's more likely to come out of interviews of some kind. Um, and, <coughs> you know, it's possible that somebody who's done a survey of household behavior, I mean, a survey, a, a, an interview study of household behavior, did have questions on their interview schedule about changes in household structure that you could ask them if you could take a look at. I mean, to give a, a, a comparative example, I, I have a whole other line of research now on um, um, cult, sort of cultural dynamics of mortgages in the United States. And um, there's only really one study out there that looks at people's understandings of mortgages in, in a systematic way in interview context from like before, you know, the housing crisis. Everybody wants to study this now. And so I'm trying to get the, the study people to give me their, their actual interviews. I haven't got them yet the transcripts, and I know that they had retrospective data in those. So often that's the way to go. Um, you know, in Western countries, there are often data archives of, you know, um, oral history interviews and things like that. I'm not aware of anything like that anywhere in, in the Eurasian context. If there is something like that. I'd love to know about it. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> um. Another question, uh, since you use methods for validating recall, do you still need validity and reliability for the survey instrument? Of course. Um, I mean, I'm not sure, I, I mean, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the distinction. I guess if you, so, so maybe one way to think about it is it's necessary but not sufficient to validate the, the capacity to recall. 
a question. Um, actually, you know, that's a really good question. Let me let me go back to the um, the calendar actually to to um, think about how to how to discuss that. Um, so actually, I can give a good example here. Um, okay, on a oops, slideshow. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is our uh, how we want. So so we validated in in um, in in depth interviews and in um, also in in the we did focus groups as well um, in in. Part of the reason we did that was uh, to verify claims I'd made based on kind of less systematic data only in one place, because I only studied Kaluga, so we went to a few different places for the focus groups. But anyway, we validated that people could, you know, recall um, with, uh, even if they couldn't recall the month, they could usually recall the season. And so we actually have an option for interviews. If they, if they don't know the month, they can put in a, a code for, you know, fall, spring, winter, you know, summer. Um, of, uh, you know, moving in and out, um, and also marriage, um, and divorce, we also wanted to know about the timing of when relationship started and ended. Because first of all, people often form relationships and then they may not they may not live together for a long time and that may actually be because of housing constraints. Maybe they're waiting until they can find a decent place to live. Um, the other issue is this was more common in the Soviet period is that you had people um, living together even after they got divorced because they couldn't find any place to go. So it would be problematic to assume that um, all the time people are living together, they're actually in a relationship. Or to assume that when they're not living together, that they're not in a serious relationship. I mean, in the, in the West, we tend to see these as kind of, you know, a progression of, a, you know, going from dating to living together to marriage, or sometimes, you know, simultaneously living together in, in marriage, but the dating is less serious than the marriage. But that may, that may, that may not be true in cases where um, it's difficult to live together because, you know, you both live with your parents and you can't afford to rent a place. Um, but, as you'll see, there's no measure here about the duration of the, of the relationship. And that's because what we found in an earlier pretest is that both the interviewers and the respondents got completely confused about what we meant about starting relationship. In fact, it actually sounded sometimes sort of crude. I mean, the language, it was kind of hard to find language because people seemed a little offended like they were asking them, when did you start having sex or something like that. Um, you know, and also, it, also we know from, from, from demographic research and other places that men and women also tend to recall that when the relationship got serious <laughs> with different dating. So, so we, we ultimately decided to drop that from our survey. And so going back to the original question about do you still need validation here, yes, because in a, in a focus group or an in-depth interview, we can figure out whether we can ask probes, we can ask follow-ups, they can ask us what we mean. We can have a conversation to establish a common understanding of what we mean when we both are talking about beginning of a relationship. Okay, but we can't do that in a, in a standardized survey. We don't have time for it and it, we can't guarantee accuracy. And so we made the decision that we, were, we would just have to let that go. The only thing that we can validly and reliably measure, we think, and again, we'll have to wait for the parent interviews to see whether that's going to work, um, uh, is, is this kind of thing. Oh, I should also say we're also going to try to interview all current partners and spouses. We're going to give them the same survey. So we're going to interview, if there's a couple, both sides of the couple. So that's another way of validating some of this stuff, to the extent that they were you know, living together, all the period they were together. Um, uh, so I hope that answered the question. It was a long-winded answer. <laughs> uh, we have a question. Uh, one person is asking about the study sampling frame and the sampling approach. And I'll just uh, preface your answer by saying um, that the previous webinar went into this in, in, in detail, and you can access that on our website. So, if Jane, if you just want to give like a shorter version of, of the answer. I'm not sure. Is she, it was a question about this particular survey. I, I believe it is, because I think this is what you talked about. About, about uh, the housing survey? About the housing survey, uh, Gulnara, is this about the housing survey? I think there's a lot. Yes, yes, it is. Oh, OK. So for this, we're, we're just interviewing. This is only um, um, Russians between 33 and 55 who were living in Russia in 1992, so we're not going to include migrants from other countries because we're interested in, in, in post-Soviet within Russia trajectories. Um, so we're, we're only studying people that were in Russia in 1992. And they have to be in that age period, and, is there, and, the, and, the, and we're only studying urban areas for two reasons. The main one is cost, because the grant we have right now isn't that big, and we just can't afford to do a very large sample if, we, if we're doing urban areas, but the, urban, rural areas. But the other reason is that um, 
you know, rural housing dynamics are just so different that it's almost like two different countries, and you'd almost just want to have two different studies. Uh, so that's the sampling frame there. On a more general sense, but when thinking about, about sampling frames, it's, a, it's, it's important, again, it's a good question because, and actually, you know, Ted Gerber is my collaborator on this, and we've, we've, we've actually worked ourselves into knots a few times uh, by, uh, with this problem of what is the population, what is the reference population when we're analyze, thinking about running models that, about things that were happening in 1992. And do we actually have, I mean, because our, 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 our sampling frame and the population we can actually make inferences to is the age range and the urban population I just referred to in, well, actually 2013 now. We're going to have to move it out to 2013 because we're a little delayed. I just realized that we need to add a year there. Um, uh, but, um, you know, so, so it it's sort of can be problematic to make, draw conclusions about this period from the respect, retrospective data, um, again, for the reasons I talked about before. So that's another sampling issue. If we had wanted to get a sample of people in 1992, if we wanted to get a sample today that would represent 1992, we would have to do some pretty funky weighting based on demographic um, phenomena um, uh, to you know, oversample people that were um, you know, in older cohorts and things like that. Um, but we're not, we're not going to try to do that. Okay, um, are there any more questions? There's uh, none here that we haven't dealt with yet. Uh, in that case, uh, I just want to thank Jane, of course, for, for her presentation. Uh, and Jane also is not feeling very well, uh, so we thank her doubly for that. Um, this is the second in a series, and so we're planning to offer two more webinars on quant methods in Eurasian studies. So we will be sending you a survey, which is very important for us in terms of our uh, overall um, monitoring and evaluation of our program. So I ask you to please uh, take a few minutes and fill that out when, when you receive it. Uh, in addition to just reporting on the, the webinar in general, uh, it'll ask you to um, offer suggestions and rate different possibilities for our future webinars. So definitely fill in the survey so we can get that information from you. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone on this Friday afternoon for taking the time. Uh, these webinars have proven to be extremely popular, and, and we're very happy uh, that there's a community of Eurasian scholars out there for this kind of um, event. And um, <clears throat> as I said, you can access on our website a recording of this webinar. We'll also post the slides, uh, and you can also access our uh, previous webinars there also, too. So thank you to everybody. And uh, have a great day. Goodbye.